Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology. It's a beautiful sunny day, a Sunday uh, in January, uh, but the sun is shining on us, so that's keeping us all going, I'm sure, if you're at home and you're enjoying that sun as well. I thought in this episode I'd come back out and take another look at trees. I did a first episode about that, went to Whiteham Woods and saw lots of trees growing in a woodland setting, but I actually realised that in my local park there are lots of other trees and more things to see and to talk about. And I really love the trees in winter, they're one of the things that really cheer me up. I love the silhouettes of the trees, having a look at them, trying to guess what they all are. So I'm standing by a black poplar here, it's got very deeply riven bark, which we'll take a closer look at in a moment and see what's growing on it. But if I ask my cameraman to pan up to the tops of these for a moment, then I hope what you could see up there was some green blobs. And those big spherical green blobs are of course mistletoe. And mistletoe is a hemiparasitic plant that plugs into the xylem vessels of the trees and sucks out uh, some of the water and the mineral ions that they're carrying. And it does very well in winter because, you know, it's a, it, it keeps its leaves on, but the, tree, the leaves of the trees have gone so it can continue to photosynthesize whenever you get a nice day and the temperature comes up high enough to allow it to do that. Okay, so these trees have been infested with mistletoe and these are the very same trees which down munching away on their roots right now are the caterpillars of the hornet moth. So it just goes to show trees look really mighty like they've got everything going for them but there's plenty of things out there that want to actually feed on them. But there are other things living on the trees that are doing no harm to the trees whatsoever and that's one of the things we want to look at now. So on the bottom of the tree you can see it's really green just on the base. It's just completely green if we look at that closely for a moment. And that is green algae. So it's green unicellular algae and it can form a thick coating on the bottoms of trees. And they're just little individual cells photosynthesizing away, hence their nice green color. But you only really see proper algae right on the bottom of trees or another little corner as well. It's a bit, a bit shady and a bit damper because algae are very prone to being desiccated. So they can't just grow on the side of the tree unless they've done what these algae have done. So if you look closely at the bark of the tree a bit higher up, you can see lots of bright orangey yellow things and some grey green things, all sort of crusty looking. And these are lichens. And a lichen is a really strange thing. It's a symbiosis between a fungus and an algae. So within those um, lichens, there are little green algal cells trapped inside, photosynthesizing away. But they are being protected by the fungus. And it's the fungus that can produce some of those other pigments, the bright orange colours, and those are protective. So you can find algae, you can find lichen, sorry, growing on bare rock right at the top of mountains, very high levels of ultraviolet radiation, still functioning because the fungus can protect the algae. Now there's got to be something in it for the fungus and it's going to take some of the carbon that the algae are fixing for itself, so it's stealing sugars if you like from the algae, but it's providing something to the algae as well, as well as protection. It's really good at extracting mineral ions uh, from the bark or from the rock or wherever it's growing. So it's a great example of a symbiosis and this is the best time of year to see them, they're really popping out from the trunks of trees, see how many different kinds you can find. Okay, so we've stopped by a line of trees here that have been grown as an ornamental line of trees to screen the houses off from the park. And what's interesting about when you see a line of trees like this when they're outside of a woodland is that they've got to try, always trees are trying to capture as much light as they possibly can. And in a woodland that means growing up, getting the height on, growing as tall as you can, as quickly as you can and getting your leaves up to that canopy. But if you're out in the open and you're not surrounded by other trees, then the best strategy is to try to grow out sideways as much as you can. So that's, you can capture light all around you. And no tree does that better than this. This is hornbeam. And look at the incredible shapes that it creates. 
So it has a really large number of sideways branches going off and it can almost be wider than it is tall. So that's Hornbeam. It's related to beech and in Oxford anyway, there's quite a few places where you can see beautiful lines of Hornbeam. So in the park, we have quite a lot of horse chestnut trees. There's very characteristic buds on the horse chestnut. So they have what are called sticky buds. So big fat buds covered in a sticky substance. That's important to the tree because it wants to protect the buds. Inside there is the new leaf. It's already made and it's getting ready to be pumped up when the weather allows. And so it wants to protect it from any herbivores or insects that might want to come and land on it. And as they swell, they get stickier and stickier. So it gets more and more difficult for any insects to come and land on them and start feeding on them. Now I stopped by this tree in particular because it's got an interesting feature. If we have a look here, you can see a branch has ripped off here. Now that might have been during a storm or um, it could have been damaged caused by a vehicle, who knows? But you can see it's really ripped down and it's left the tree badly exposed, pulled off this region of bark. And this is exactly how fungi get into trees. So trees are susceptible to fungal attack. Fungi can attack living trees and especially if they can find a way in like that. And we're going to go find another tree where you can see the branch was cut off better and how the tree can actually seal off a wound very well indeed if it gets the chance to. Okay, so stop by another horse chestnut. There's lots of them in this park. We're just going to scan up and see where a branch has been cut off tidily by the park's team. And what you can see is the way the tree is closing up around that cut surface. It doesn't want to leave that fresh cut surface there. That's the entry point for fungi. And so it can grow and gradually seal that off. And if the cut's been done nicely and cleanly, it can do that relatively quickly. And if you look closely on trees, you'll see ones that have been completely healed over. You can almost not see that once there was a branch there that had been cut off. And if it's pruning time, you know, if you've got trees at home, apple trees, fruit trees, now is the time to prune them while they're dormant in the winter with very few exceptions most trees much better to prune them in the winter and do it nicely like this cut the branch off close to where it joins the trunk uh, don't go absolutely tight you've got to leave room for that collar to grow around but don't leave a little stump sticking off because that will die and again it's a root in for fungi so there are lots of conifers in this park and i don't know what they all are because there'll be things from all over the world but I've just stopped by this one. I do know what this one is. And you can see it's a conifer because it's bearing a little cone. All right, and that's what conifer means, cone bearing. So these are gymnosperms rather than angiosperms. So they're seed plants, but they're not flowering plants. They're more ancient than angiosperms. Most of the plants we see around us are angiosperms. These are more ancient and we would have had forests of gymnosperms all over the planet in the past. But the angiosperms took over sometime when the dinosaurs were around and basically pushed most of the gymnosperms out. But they didn't manage to push them out completely. So why is it sometimes better to produce needles? And if you are going to produce needles, should you be evergreen or should you be deciduous? Because this, you can see, doesn't have any needles on it, right? This tree is bare in the winter, but it's definitely got cones and it is larch. And larch is a deciduous conifer. And you might wonder why. Well, the idea is that in temperate Europe, most of our forests are broadleaf trees. Trees that make a leaf for the, the growing season and then they throw that leaf away in the winter. And that's because in the winter that leaf would just get far too much damage. You know, it's far too cold, it's windy, that root leaf would just be wrecked. The conifers instead invest in much longer lived needles. So they invest a lot in them, they pack them with resins to deter herbivores and they're going to last for several years. So why is the, the, the broadleaf a better strategy? Well, it seems that in many seasonal climates, it's better to just make these cheap throwaway leaves, use them for one season. At the end of the season, the tree will take back all of the nitrogen that it can and just cast off the carbon that it can remake next spring. And it will store it in the bark and in the roots and use that nitrogen again in the spring when it leaves out. The disadvantage of that strategy, it's great because you're not going to suffer damage to the leaves over the winter, but when the spring comes and the temperatures rise, you can't get going straight away, right? You've got to flush out those new leaves and that takes time. And as they're flushing out, they're also really vulnerable, vulnerable to frost, vulnerable to herbivores who lay in wait for them. So the conifer needles can get started a bit faster, but it seems that they're not as efficient, those leaves. They're the little thin needles, they don't capture light as well. And so in many parts of the UK and Europe, the, the broadleaf tree wins out. 
But if you go up mountains in Switzerland or further north, then the conifers, the evergreen conifers like pines, can start to have an advantage as the winter gets colder uh, and the growing season gets shorter and shorter for those broadleaf trees. But if you go really, really far north, you start to get this large. And that's because the winter's so harsh and so difficult that you can't even make a needle that's going to survive the winter without getting so much damage. And so the needle trees are still in charge, but they actually throw away their needles over the winter and they just make a cheap uh, needle uh, that won't, they'll only last a single season. And they're really beautiful when they leaf out in the spring. They have a really beautiful fresh green colour. So if you've got a larch growing near you, keep an eye on it as spring arrives. So the last tree for the day, I'm standing by something that looks like one of those kind of kids' toys. I remember a time when these little troll things were popular and there was a kind of stumpy kind of animal with a massive shock of hair. And that's what happens when you pollard a tree. And willow is very commonly pollarded like this. It takes to it quite well. So what somebody's done is just chopped the top of it, chopped all the upper limbs off, and out of those upper limbs will sprout long, thin, straight uh, twigs. And those were actually incredibly useful. Remember we said in the Whiten one that there used to be a system called coppicing. Uh, which they're trying to reinstate in some woodlands around Britain. If you want nice long thin poles because they're very useful for things, then you can coppice hazel by cutting it right down to the ground and letting it regrow. Now the problem with that is that animals then come and eat the regrowth, so you have to fence it and keep out deer. Now in the past, when there was a lot more common land in Britain and people had access to it, and they wanted two things from it often. They wanted somewhere to graze their livestock, but they also needed a source of firewood and timber. And this was a system that was developed called wood pasture. And you would basically have grassland, but you'd have intermittent trees like this willow that you would pollard. And the great advantage of pollarding is all that new regrowth is out of reach of my grazing animals. So I don't need to fence them off. I can have my cows wandering around and the trees will go on producing useful timber. And I can come and take off some of that timber and my animals can still graze underneath and the willow never gets big enough to really shade the grass out. So I guess in this little corner of the park they're trying to recreate the feel of wood pasture with several of these pollarded willows dotted around. Okay, well that's it for this week. I know we're still in the middle of an absolutely terrible situation. I urge everybody, obviously, to use the utmost caution. We're always coming out very carefully. Um, just me and my son who's doing the filming. We're staying well away from anybody else. Uh, and we all have to do that until we can get on top of this hideous virus. So take care and see you next time on Back Garden Biology.